the alternative energy stimulation is a weeks-long process where students start by uh, researching different alternative energies, at least alternatives to fossil fuels, so things like geothermal, tidal, wave, uh, solar, nuclear, and start by looking into those different industries um, to learn more about them. How is the energy generated? How much does it cost? How much does it produce? As well as, and I make this an important point for them to focus on, well, how much uh, pollution is going to be created by these? Because I point out to them that every single industry has a certain amount just from the building and the current infrastructure. So trying to help them get a more realistic picture of what these energies look like. From there, in phase two, what they have to do is they have to try to sell them uh, to each other. So they come up with their own infographic of the uh, highlights of their energy, and then basically try to convince their uh, other classmates that this is the alternative energy they wanna be investing in. And then finally in part three, what they do is that we take those numbers that they authentically researched and developed, and we put it into a simulation where each lab group represents their own alternative energy kind of interest group. So the solar group is gonna act as a group that's trying to kind of push for more solar energy to be adopted. And over the course of five rounds, these groups have to debate with each other um, how much of their country's budget to put in each of those uh, energies. And what makes it challenging is that as time goes on, um, they have to account for things like uh, an increasing amount of pollution, a changing population, energy demands, budget, as well as uh, random effects that may occur called issues that can most of the time harm them, make things more difficult, um, but a few times can also help them and try to balance all that um, together. So there, it's balancing research, it's balancing um, kind of diplomacy, it's also balancing numbers and a very, very multifaceted project that kind of gives them at least I hope a little bit more of a realistic picture of what it's like to interact with these industries on that level. Who's got a good proposal? The, the idea for the project started with me taking a look at the new standards. Um, one of the new standards that it came out a couple years ago was for students to engage in argumentation from evidence regarding the ethical, social, economic, and political benefits and liabilities of energy usage and transfer. When I first thought about it, I was thinking, ah, I could just have them do a research project and have a roundtable discussion, and that would be okay. Um, but really where it organically came from is uh, a lot of my personality. I love games, and I love the idea of gamifying things and having students talking with each other and discussing things, not knowing the end game, not knowing the end result, and having the students try to organically figure out is something that just really interested me. I mean, I, I do this with my other labs too, where I don't know what the end result's gonna be, but I let them explore and I let them try it and do it themselves and we see what the data tells us. Yeah, this, is, this is confidential. Okay, we got a better one now. So then it occurred to me, I could do this with these alternative energies, but make it more of a game. Because this is round two, we are now going to roll two six-sided die to see if we have more industry issues. These activate on a one or a two. I got one in a four. Somebody's getting an industry issue. That team is wind. I know. Wind is getting hyperstorm. Reduce the uh, reduce twenty percent or remove twenty percent of your installations and increase your energy demand by twenty percent of what was invested into wind. Okay. What? So, we kind of needed it. What is a hyperstorm? It started as just a let's sit down and see if they can figure out numbers. Um, trying to like a, a pure cooperative sense. Like I encourage them like, oh, just find a way that it come together. And then it slowly started to become an issue of, well, if this is a game, there's gonna have to be some competition. There's gonna have to be some conflict. Right, it's no, it's not, cause look at Wave. I mean, look at Wave, look at Wave. Yeah. Life where economically everyone is, you know has their own self interest everyone has their own needs and need to meet and that's nothing there's nothing wrong with that but in pure economics you know it's that issue of there are infinite needs but limited resources so how do you get that to to work I mean in the sense that's economics and that's politics you can't have all of these types of renewable energies in one country it's just not possible not everyone has a coastline so I decided to have my simulation have more of those restrictions so that it would model it. So that's why everyone's got the same goal of trying to get 35 points, and it's definitely possible. Um, but to for everyone to get it, well, that's incredibly challenging in this simulation. And um, then really just, I think, organically letting them discuss and not imposing, okay, well, you have to do this or you have to share and not tell them, just figure it out on your own. It's like if we got like 700. Yeah, but we also have a. 
four global penalties. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, what if they realize, if I just set it up, this will happen naturally. And it's not until kind of the first round of the simulation where we start to put numbers in and they go, oh, wait a minute, this one's very different than the others. And they realize that although it's the same game and although it's the same kind of overall rules, the numbers that they researched, the numbers that they found out themselves, make it asymmetrical. Or is it three? Oh, you're, she's right. Let's just do 100% fossil fuel. Wait, we have, we have a plan. Kill everyone. Even though in this simulation, you guys got to directly see how your population was changing, and then that still got put to the wayside, because like, oh yeah, whatever. A million people died off, who cares, whatever. And just moved on. Think about how, how that might reflect in real life, where do you get to see those numbers? And I think what I try to hope the, that they realize is that these are some of the issues that real world politicians and world leaders and industry leaders have to deal with. Nobody wants a Fukushima to occur, but sometimes it does. Now, the global issue is going to be <laughs> nuclear exterminate. <laughs> Well, first of all, they enjoy the assignment. Yeah. A lot of them say that it's like, well, this is the most engaged I've ever been like this year. And, and that's yeah. encouraging to me. Um, a lot of their comments uh, kind of come out of, they like to talk about the social dynamic. There was a lot of like trying to communicate, but a lot of the communication, a lot of the times kind of ended up with arguing. Especially and what's fun about that is, is that directly science? No, but are they learning? Are they discussing? Yes. What I like more is that, I see them engaging and thinking about things at a level that is way more advanced than any lecture that I could provide. They're really thinking about how do things go because I think part of it is they're uh, invested. They're emotionally invested. They're academically invested. They, they want to win as much as they can. Um, and so they put everything they have into it and it's really exciting to see that. Four, three, two, one. Votes up please. Passes. There's hardly any equations in this unit or in this activity. It's not the focus. The focus is bringing it out of the classroom and into something that's a little bit more realistic. Bring it into the, well, let's talk about the real world context of these things. Like most of the pollution that you guys had wasn't due to you. Most of it was just due to like industry effects, random stuff that can occur. Well, we need energy to do work, but we only have so much of it here on earth. And now the realistic complication is, well, these have costs. These have detriments and not just like financial costs. These have environmental costs. These have land costs. These have, you know, social costs. What are those? You need to keep at least one person alive in your country after this round. Yeah, which I can't tell you exactly, but I can say not looking good. If, you know, if you ask a bad question, you're going to get bad answers. If you ask a good question, though, you'll get good answers. And so I would encourage people to just think about the curriculum that they have and what they do now and think about, okay, it's not to say that what, should, what, what they're doing is bad. And you know, like having a project presentation is not necessarily bad, but can we ask it in a different way? Can we ask them to engage with this topic and, and the subject matter in a different way that might produce different questions and therefore different answers? Because maybe asking that question in a slightly different way gives you all sorts of different answers that can be so fruitful, can be so um, you know beneficial for their learning. These are realistic problems. So given all of that we talked about with infrastructure, with costs, with, with building and things like that, why should we even bother? Why, why would it be, why should we, if at all? Maybe we shouldn't, but why? Part of the reason why I was willing to put so much effort into something like this is because I was excited about it. And it was something that I wanted to do, that I wanted to, to try this out. And I was putting in numbers and trying things over and over and over and running it for such a long time because I was excited about it. And it was something that I enjoyed doing. So finding something that relates to your interests is also a great idea because then the students can see that. They can see if you're actually excited about a particular issue. Well, I guess in the, in the last point, um, that I think I would mention is just don't be afraid to ask questions that you don't know the answer to Because so often particularly in science I mean, there's nothing that I'm teaching my students that hasn't already been answered There's nothing like you know the, the Newton's laws has already been answered. You know all these equations have already been answered there's, there's no there we know what the answers to these are but going along the lines of asking those good questions Consider asking a question that you don't actually know the answer to because if you do that 
it opens up the field for the students to find the answer, to find their own answers, and to point out to them that like, is that the only answer? And it opens up their mind to way more possibilities. Whereas if we just ask a question and we know what the answer is, then we are naturally going to direct them towards what we think is the right answer. So, it, it, and it's uncomfortable. It is really uncomfortable not knowing if, if they're going to get to the answers that you want or even what is the right answer. But asking the question differently and asking something where you don't know the right answer opens up the field so much more for so much more creativity, so much more excitement, and a lot more thinking on their part and less on your part. And I think that's where a lot of learning can happen um, organically from, from just their own thoughts, their, or their own perspectives, and it comes from them rather than me telling them what they should know. They figure it out for themselves, and in the end, that's kind of what the point is. Yeah, yeah, yeah.